Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and uh, we just pray that as we go into your word and look at uh, many different places in it today, that you would humble our hearts and our minds to receive what it says for what it says, uh, to be open and uh, honest with ourselves and with where we stand before you and in the light of the truth of your word. Pray that you would give us a sense of uh, gratitude for the, the peace and safety that we experience gathering here and that you would keep safe our brothers and sisters around the world who are gathering in <coughs> caves or basements or any other place in fear of persecution. Pray that your spirit would be with them and you, you would strengthen them and strengthen their leaders. Pray, God, that as we, again, as we go into this study that you would have us to receive uh, exactly what you want us to receive from your word and help us to go into it with an open and humble heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to do something <clears throat> a little different today. We've been kind of going through the book of Romans, uh, you know, section by section. Um, but today we're going to kind of interrupt that to explore the topic of church leadership and the structure of a biblical church. So um, this is going to be rather than... Um, uh, a focused exposition of like a specific text, we're going to do an overview of 10 specific texts to give us an understanding of what the whole council of Scripture has to say about this issue. So the way that we're going to do this is uh, we're going to read those passages, we're going to briefly summarize the content of those passages, and then we're going to talk about what inferences or conclusions we can get from those passages. So the first passage that we're going to read is going to be from the book of Acts, and the last passage, as we flow chronologically, will be in 1 Peter. So if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to start in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, and I'll uh, kind of tell you where we're going as we're going as we fly over the Scriptures. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Our next passage is going to be Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. It says, When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And now we're going to Acts chapter 20. And we're going through many places. you got to have nimble fingers. <laughs> Acts 20 verse 17, it says, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And then in further down in that same chapter, starting at verse 28, he says to those elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in, and, excuse me, come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now we're flipping over to Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. <laughs> Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Flipping over now to 1 Timothy. You guys are going to have to have nimble fingers here. <laughs> First, <clears throat> First Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy in chapter 3. 
beginning in verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Let them, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Flipping over to chapter 4, <laughs> verse 11 through 16. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Preserve in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And in chapter 5, starting in verse 17, it says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. We've got three more flipping over to Titus, the letter to Titus, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dis dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict." Got two more, flipping over to the letter of James, the epistle of James, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, says, <clears throat> Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And last but not least, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore I exert, excuse me, exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. 
For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Please be seated. <laughs> Y'all did a lot of work there standing. I appreciate that. Everybody's getting a good leg workout today. <laughs> so now that we've kind of given a, a, a brief overview of the passages that we're going to spend some time in today, uh, we're going to kind of look at them and give some uh, context to the meaning and what we are supposed to get from them. So starting with our first passage, that is going to be Acts chapter 6. It says, again, I'm just going to read it to you again so it's fresh in your mind. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Notice a few things here. The church has, at this point, has grown so rapidly. Remember in Acts, it talks about the birth of the church in Pentecost, how People had come from all over the world to celebrate that feast. And the Holy Spirit descended and the church was born. People were hearing the gospel preached in their own language from no matter where they were from. This was the only church in the whole world at the time. They couldn't go back to a home church. That's why they were all staying there. And they, you know, as you, you read the, the growing counts that they record, you know, it's 3,000 on this day, you know, 2,000 on this day. Now there's thousands and thousands, and the apostles are having all of these issues brought to them, and they're like, guys, we, we can't deal with this. We're being charged by God to be teachers. We have to study the word and show you the doctrine that Christ taught us. And we can't do that if we're trying to handle every bit of the day-to-day and all of the rulings and stuff. So you need to appoint from among you people who will handle these matters. And so that's what we're getting into. They're supposed to be devoted to teaching the word of God, but they're getting overwhelmed. So here we see the beginning of two separate offices or roles in the church, and we're going to define those as we go. Our second passage is Acts chapter 14, as we read a moment ago. Acts chapter 14, beginning in... 14, Acts 14, verse 23. And it says, When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now they, of course, there is Paul and Barnabas. So again, the church is now spread out. There's still the apostles and elders there in Jerusalem. But Paul has been commanded by Christ personally to take the gospel to all the nations And you can see in the back of your Bibles, there's probably a little map. And you can see all of Paul's frequent flyer miles as he goes around (laughs) all of the Roman world to all the various cities. And often getting beaten and imprisoned on on those trips. But they're establishing all these churches in those cities. So that way the gospel can continue there and that people can continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And that's the main goal. And so what do they do? They appoint... Elders, and that word there in the Greek is presbyteros, presbyteros, which is which is a uh, you know funny word. <laughs> the this is the first time we see it used of church leaders. Previously, the word was used uh, in reference to the Jewish synagogues, the elders, those who had studied the Old Testament for a long time. They were called the elders of the temple. Now Paul is adopting that word to apply it to the new Christian religion, the new Christian faith, and saying, this is the office of elder. These are going to be who will direct and teach and guide the church in all the cities that I establish. Okay? It's used nine other times, uh, so ten total, in Acts, to reference the spiritual leadership of uh, the local church that's distinguished from the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets are the ones establishing these elders to, in a sense, take their place, and that's what we'll get to in a, mo- in a moment. And they establish these in every church, not in some churches, <laughs> every church. They, they knew how important it was for each church to have godly leaders uh, to, to, well, they knew the church was going to war, both physically with the Roman authorities because the Romans were actively persecuting them, trying to root them out, and the Jews were persecuting them. Saul was one of them. Paul, Saul was one of them. 
Um, but also they were going into spiritual warfare. And the, the forces that, that were at work, the, the spiritual uh, principalities in high places, as Paul says, are constantly at work trying to shut down the gospel. So, they, so Paul knew that in all of these places, they would need godly men to lead them and to ordain elders so that they could maintain that role of teaching and guardianship of those new believers. He couldn't just leave them there without any sort of direction or leadership. And it says, they appointed them with prayer and fasting. We're going to come back to that later. Uh, he says, they commended them to the Lord. That word there for commended is uh, paradit me. Again, I'm, <laughs> I do not speak Greek. I just practice it. <laughs> uh, it. That word literally means to set before, like if you were to set before a meal. Um, it means to deposit or entrust to, to bring forward, to quote as evidence. They're commending them, bringing them forth to the Lord. Okay? So that's, that's the image he's trying to, trying to portray. They set them apart as leaders and teachers of the church before the Lord. It's a separate office, and they are accountable to that office, to the Lord himself. It's a high calling. Uh, our third passage is going to be Acts chapter 20. If you flip over to chapter 20. This is... <clears throat> It was verse 17, and then again starting at 28. It says, From uh, Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So he's summoning, there's that word again, presbyteros. He has established this church, and now he's writing to them, gathering together. He said, those men that we appointed to be your leaders, bring them. It's time that we have a meeting. We need to address what's going on. So in verse 28 he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among, from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That word there, be on guard, it evokes the image of, of David shepherding his, his flock. And David talks often about, you know, I was ready whenever the, the bears came, whenever the wolves came, the Lord was with me, and I, I took care of them, and now this giant's going to be nothing. I got this. I have experience. I have have this track record of faith and obedience, and I know that the Lord will carry me through. And that's kind of what Paul's, Paul is calling them to do here. He's saying, have that, that level of alertness, that level of responsibility to the flock of God that he has put underneath you. Because there are many wolves who plot to kill the sheep. Amen. You can look around uh, and just look even on social media and see the clips that get shared and a lot of the the, the teaching that is out there is directly contradictory to what the Word says. Amen. It says, be on guard. And so who are, we, who are the overseers to be on guard for? They're to be on guard first for themselves. You know, they're supposed to be above reproach, as we'll get to in a moment. You know, the, the, the verse even going back to Genesis, sin crouches at the door, ready to pounce and devour any who it can. So they're supposed to be above reproach. They have to be constantly on guard for themselves because they are the shepherds and the overseers of the flock. Amen. And they're supposed to be on guard for the flock. As, again, as a shepherd, this represents the, the church that God has gathered in a particular place and appointed and charged elders uh, or overseers uh, responsibility with. So they have the great dual responsibility of standing guard, not only for themselves, but for the flock of God that is underneath them. That word there for overseer is episkopos. That's easier to say. I don't have a problem with that one. <laughs> um, it was an uh, official title in the civil authorities of Paul's day in that area of Greece. It was used when the central authority in Athens would send men out to oversee the functions of a particular city. They were the episkopoi, which is the uh, plural of that word. And so Paul borrows that office, the language in the Greek of that office, to represent how uh, 
the elders and overseers of the church are appointed and sent by our high authority, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and appointed to specific locations wherein they are directly responsible back to him for what goes on there. It is a high, high office, and it bears great, great responsibility. And uh, it says they're, they're to shepherd. The word literally means shepherd. <laughs> Tend, herd, rule, govern. The, the weight of uh, church leadership falls on these shepherds, and, and they're, to, they're to be on guard from wolves, and I think this is the key word, wolves, wolves from among you. That's kind of scary to think about. Yeah. The, the, they have the great responsibility of, falling, of calling out false teachers, even from among their own groups. That's, that's a heavy burden to, to even see people sometimes that you've known for decades. You know, and yeah. and we're, we're called to, to do it in, in, in love and in truth, but that is a great responsibility. Now, it says, be alert. Literally, the word means stay awake. So elders cannot sleep. They're just constantly on caffeine. <laughs> uh, no, the, it just means it's, it's to uh, evoke the image of a guard. You know, they're, they're supposed to stay awake. The enemy prowls around often at night. You know, that's, that's the, the time that the, the graveyard shift is, is the struggle. <laughs> uh, he commends them to uh, God and the word of his grace. That's that same paradidomai from earlier. He commends them, sets them before God, says, these are the elders that you've chosen, and we are setting them here in honor of what you have said, how you have said, how you have told us to do this, and we are charging them before God to you. Again, I'm going to reiterate, this is a high responsibility. Flipping over to uh, Philippians 1 for just a moment, it says, uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I include this one just to further establish that this is Paul's pattern. This is how, as he's going throughout the entire Gentile world, these two offices are how he sets up church organization. It's Philippians 1 verse 1. And he says, the saints, again, we've kind of talked about that word before. It's hagios in the Greek. It's set apart. It means holy, but literally that word holy means set apart, typically from, you know, from sin, from the world. And he says, to the saints there in Christ Jesus. And he, he is evoking there the imagery uh, that he talks about before of the whole community of believers being one body, one family. You know, he talks about brothers and sisters. All over the world, wherever the true church is gathering, those are our literal family members, closer to us in many ways than flesh and blood. Amen. And that's a concept I think the American church in particular has, has gotten away from. Now he says, including, so there's the broad group of all the saints, and then there's subgroups, including the overseers, that's the episkopos, and the deacons, which is diakonos. It's almost a direct translation. So he addresses the overseers, the deacons, and all the saints. And I, I include this again just so that we, we can have even further evidence that this is exactly how Paul is setting up these churches because it's important for us to have a good, clear understanding of how we are supposed to follow the biblical model. Right. So going over to uh, one of our main passages for today, it's 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is going to be the, the central text where we get a lot of the definitions of what all of this really means. Again, that's 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to take this a paragraph at a time, because we're going to do uh, the first paragraph and then the second paragraph. Paragraph 1, it says, It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, Temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, 
how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Again, that word for overseer is episcope. That's that, that legal title that he's borrowed. It's a noun. This is one of uh, the key terms that we're kind of defining here. It has three forms in which it is used in the scripture. So there's a verb form, which is episcopeo. That's the, the action of being an overseer, caring for or expressing oversight. In Hebrews, it's used, it says, see to it that no one comes. It's a, it's a, a, a strong verb. It's, it's exercising a vision and to look after with great care is the imagery that it, that it uses. And then uh, the other two nouns are episcope and episcopos. One is the event or the office, and the other is uh, the specific person or the specific title. And that's important <clears throat> just to um, give us a better understanding of what Paul means. And when he's trying to set forth these overseers, there's... Uh, the act of overseeing, there's the office of overseeing, and then there's the title. This is a, a very clear, um, he, he's very specific in his wording. Greek is a specific language, and Paul is using Greek to be very specific in what he's talking about here. And verses 2 through 7 elaborate on the qualities that these overseers are to portray. He says, be above reproach. Uh, that, that word literally means not be able to be held. It's a, a, an, a, an umbrella term for all of the rest of the qualities that he's about to get into. So when he says the husband of one wife, it literally means in the Greek a one-woman man. It's a, a prohibition against adultery. You can't be uh, an overseer. You can't be a leader of the church and allow that in your life. It says they're supposed to be temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable. This just means we're supposed to be clear-headed, Disciplined in priorities, orderly, open and caring to all those who both are under us and who come into the church. It says, primarily here, able to teach. This is the function of the overseer. It's what they are commended to both in Acts frequently and here in Paul's letters and as we'll get into in Peter's epistle as well. This is the distinction between overseers and deacons that we will see. Uh, the overseers or the elders are the teachers of the church. It says, not addicted to wine. Now, even uh, in the last verse, uh, Paul tells Timothy, you know, you have some stomach problems. Drink a little wine for your stomach. sake." It's not saying that they can't consume alcohol at all. It is a prohibition on being drunk, drunkenness, or being addicted or controlled by alcohol. Again, not pugnacious. It says, not a giver of blows is what that literally means. Elders must respond to situations with wisdom, with calmness, and dignity, not by resorting to violence. It says there's there to be gentle and peaceable, free from the love of money. Free from the love of money is a big one. There's, I mean, if you just look at most of the mega pastors, as you might call them in the United States, the, the love of money is, a, is their chief characteristic. And they dishonor the flock of God that they've been charged over and the greater community of Christians whenever they act like that. Who manages his household well. Back in the day, the, the wife and the ch children of the overseer was part of their resume whenever they were brought forth to the community. Keeping his children under control with all dignity. Not a new convert. A good reputation. So even amongst those who are outside, they may not agree with the truth that we don't shy away from, but they shouldn't be able to bring a valid uh, accusation against us. Billy Graham often had this rule, and I think it's a solid rule. <laughs> he, he was known throughout all of his, his people that would organize where he was going, that any time that they were figuring out how he was going to get to a place, they never let him be alone with uh, a woman, someone of the opposite sex, with him. They didn't let it happen. <laughs> and that was his rule. He said, Whenever, wherever I'm going, you guys don't ever set that up because I don't want anyone to be able to even accuse our ministry of such a thing. He took this very, very seriously. Amen. And I think that's, uh, with how, depending on how, how strong you want to look at that, I think it's a good rule for how the elders are supposed to act. The, the next paragraph there, 1 Timothy, it says, Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, 
not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's a few things to note here. That word diakonos for deacon, it means servant or minister, one who cares or ministers for. Uh, it's used, again, in three forms in Scripture. The verb form, diakoneo, is in Greek writings um, <clears throat> from even before the New Testament period to be uh, a servant, an attendant, to serve or wait upon. The nouns mean uh, waiting at a table or the uh, event of service, service or ministering to a group. Uh, and the, the specific title means anyone who performs a service or an administrator of a goal. And it's important that we get technical with these definitions so that we clearly understand what we're talking about here. The root word for deacon, I think, is really cool. It literally means to kick up dust. As in running, <laughs> kicking up dust, a trail of dust behind you. It is, this office is characterized by godly men and women who tirelessly work to use the gifts that God has given them in service to the church and in, even uh, into the broader community as a whole. They stir up dirt behind them by how fervently they take the office that God has given them. That's a great picture, I think, of how they're supposed to do that. Uh, so, so look at the qualifications. They're, they're very closely in line with those listed for overseers, except for the fact that deacons are not required to be able to teach. That's the key difference. They may be able to teach, but they're not required to be able to teach. The deacons serve using their gifts so that the elders, overseers, can shepherd and teach the church. There's a dual office here. One of the greatest examples of deacons uh, is from Romans 16, where Paul commends Phoebe, a deacon or deaconess, depending upon how you want to read the word, of the church to the church in Rome. And she is the one who delivers the letter of Romans to the church in Rome. Because Paul is delayed, he can't do anything there. And so he sends her, and there's some really... Some of them are kind of fantastical, but I would encourage you to look them up. Uh, accounts of how uh, Phoebe was almost caught and all this stuff, and she just happened to manage to get exactly where she needed to be in the Church of Rome to deliver, like, the biggest of Paul's letters, a huge chunk of the New Testament. And we would not have that, that letter without her willingness to serve and literally to kick up dust <laughs> as she was running trying to escape persecution. The point of this passage is, that without both a group of godly men who are above reproach and leading the church and teaching the church and a group of godly men and women who faithfully carry out the necessary operation of the church, it can't function as God intended it to. Now, we're going to go on to our uh, sixth passage here. It's 1 Timothy 4. It's just the next one over. It says, Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, Show yourself an example to those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and those who hear you. So keep in mind, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is an elder that he's appointed of a local church. He's, he says, don't let people look down on your youth, your physical age. Um, so he, he's talking about how uh, elders are called to be spiritual mature, even if you know, some of them, like Timothy, are fairly young. Thinking about the Apostle John, some believe the Apostle John may have still been a teenager during Jesus' ministry. And yet he was out here you know, trying to establish things, and he might have still had a cracky voice. <laughs> Oh, man. If you ever look at some of the traditional paintings that are done by the Apostle John, you can see this, too. Sometimes they paint him very, very young. And uh, they, they get that from context clues that are kind of above my head. I don't really get that. But there's, there's a sizable amount of scholars that believe he was a teenager. So I just commend that to you because I think that was very interesting. So he says, give attention to, focus on the reading of Scripture. 
So this is his, his highest commendation to the elders, is that your goal is to be the expositing or the bringing forth of the scripture, what has been written and given to you. It says, don't neglect your gifts, because those gifts are how the church functions. And he says he was appointed by the laying on of hands. So the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Again, that's just the plural form of elder. And we're going to come back to that later. It says, be absorbed in them. That, that word literally means to exist in them. Have your being in the word of God. That's, a high, <laughs> that's an important calling. It says, whenever you get home, whenever you wake up, whenever you go to bed, whatever you do, exist, elders, in the word of God. Let that consume your very being. And he says, pay close attention to the, the determination uh, that the elders show is evidence and assurance of their salvation and an example to the flock, and it is a light to the world that the gospel changes those who take it seriously. And that's, again, a high calling for us. First Timothy chapter 5, just over to the next chapter, it says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Again, we see that word elders there. It's presbyteros, as we mentioned earlier. And it says, those who rule well, that word in the Greek is proistemi, which means to preside, rule over, give attention to, direct, maintain, practice diligently. And this just clarifies further. The responsibility of leading the church is placed upon these elders, these godly men who have this long list of requirements placed before them. It says they are worthy of double honor. That word for honor is a price. You know, it's used in the scriptures. You were bought with a price. It's that same word. Worthy of the, the honor due the work that is done. It says, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So this is where we get the idea of a teaching elder or a pastor. This is where that's based from. Uh, it's an elder who specializes in teaching the word. All elders are at least able to teach, but those who labor and specialize in it are worthy of their wages, the scripture says, if they do it well and faithfully. And I think the problem of, uh, one of the big problems of the American church is we have pastors who are being paid way too much. You see the, the Kenneth Copelands of the world who are worth $700 million and do not teach the word of God faithfully. And there's a, there's a, there's a misalignment of priorities here. It says, uh, on the basis of two or three witnesses. So that just means to be very careful about believing everything we hear. Even uh, small accusations. You see this in even solid churches a lot where one person will start a, uh, a rumor or a gossip and it just destroys people's families and later they find out there's no truth. Now there are, of course, cases of abuse and those should be brought forth and they are serious as well. But I think the importance there is on two or three witnesses. It's a perp uh, a, a Emphasis placed on closely finding the truth of the matter because we're to publicly rebuke those elders. Think about Christ's uh, explanation of how to deal with sin in the church. If someone wrongs you, you go one-on-one -on -one and try and deal with it. If that doesn't work, you bring the elders of the church. If that doesn't work, you bring them before the whole congregation. And if the sinful behavior continues, they're to be put out from the church so that we can keep ourselves pure which is a serious thing. You don't often see that in churches again. Um, but it's something that's clearly taught by the Lord of the church. Yeah. Favoritism has no place amongst the elders of the church and amongst the broad congregation of the church. Mm -hmm. Just because we like people, just because they're popular, just because they have a lot of friends, just because they're charismatic, does not mean that they are above reproach. We are all to be held to a great and high standard. That last verse there just seems to uh, further cement that in a sense, we, rep we represent each other as a group of elders. When one elder sins, the reputation of the whole group 
is tarnished. And not just of the whole group, but of the church and of Christians everywhere. Got a few more. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 5. It says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refuse, excuse me, refute those who contradict. So the qualifications here are virtually identical to the previous text, but notice here that in this one, the word for elder and overseer are used interchangeably. That's how we get the idea that they are in the same office. Uh, the key defining role there is that they are to A, be able to exhort or teach in sound doctrine. So they have to be existing in that sound doctrine so they can teach it. And they have to be able to refute those who contradict. And we are to actively refute those who contradict. And there are many false teachers today, again, who are leading mass amounts of people astray. Amen. That's a failure of the elders of the church. Two more. In James 5, verse 14 and 15, we're going to just talk on this one for a second. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And he has, if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And this is just another one of the key functions of this group of elders. The word there for sick is both used of physical sickness, of illness, and of spiritual sickness, of spiritual weakness, addiction, struggles with sin. In either case, the elders of the church are to be called together to pray for that person. And that's the model that we're given by the word. And with that, without that key function, I think uh, COVID has been a really good example of this. People have shifted to being more uh, online or not going and gathering. And uh, you know, there are health conditions, of course, that necessitate that. But if we fall into that too long, we run the risk of being isolated from the body of Christ. Amen. And many can fall into despair and isolation from that. Amen. Last passage for today. First Peter chapter 5, it says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Notice here that the Apostle Peter identifies himself with them as an elder. That's why earlier in our first uh, passage we mentioned in Acts that in a way the position of leadership that the apostles and prophets occupied was passed on to the elders and overseers, not their apostolic authority in the writing of the New Testament or anything, but that office was passed to them just as that group of seven that they chose to serve is passed on to the deacons. And that's testified by the... Um, the typology in the letters, and the testimony of the early church. Now, the rest of the passage, again, comments on proper motivations for church leadership. So in the past, there's specific qualifications given. Peter speaks for a moment on the willingness to serve, the eagerness, the, the motivations from within for that service. They're to be humble, not trying to get rich, not lording it over the church, but leading through examples with great humility. So as we look at those, what do, we, what, is, what do all of these passages mean for us as a church? How, how are we supposed to organize ourselves because of those? So we have a few questions. What is the purpose of the church? Why are we even here? Primarily, and the scripture all attests to this, the purpose of the church is to glorify God, to make his name holy to all the world. Well, how do we do that? We gather together and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord as a community, and as individuals. 
as we mentioned a second ago, a believer who is not plugged into a biblical, biblically modeled local church puts both himself, his family, and his community in great danger of apathy and despair. So basically for the Christian, the purpose of the church is purpose. Without the church, without the local community of believers, we're like one scattered on the sea or in the desert alone and without a family, without a body. So how should the local church be led? Well, we probably all had <clears throat> experience with poorly led churches. Some of you probably far more than I have. And typically the stories I hear from people about poorly ran churches, they involve tyranny and um, abuse of pastors. Um, and that's a terrible tragedy that is way too common in our society. But when we follow the model of uh, the biblical model of elders, pastors, and overseers, we provide a more stable platform for biblical success. Now, that doesn't mean the elders can't fail. We're clearly told that they can. But when you have a group or a council of elders, as opposed to one person being a tyranny over a church, it is a far more stable platform for leadership. Yeah. And it's a far more, this is more important, a far more biblical platform for leadership. But without an equally devoted group of men and women who use their God-given gifts and talents to serve as deacons, those elders cannot succeed, just as we learned from Acts chapter 6. We're to take these offices seriously, these responsibilities seriously. Because if we don't take them seriously, why would our children take them seriously and why would the world take us seriously? Amen. We wonder why so many children get up and they get into college and they walk away. They're like, this isn't real. People just put on a suit, they go there for an hour and they go and do the same thing. It's not real to them. It has to be real to us if it's going to be real to them. So our last question, what does it mean, elder, pastor, overseer, deacon, what does all this mean? Well, as we talked about, elders, those are the presbyteros and the overseers, the episcopoi, are synonymous terms. Both are charged with shepherding or pastoring the flock of God. These are godly, qualified men who are able to lead and teach. And again, as we mentioned earlier, deacons are also essential to the function of the body of Christ. These are those qualified men and women who dedicate themselves to the church and use their spiritual gifts to bless and care for the saints. So, what does that mean for this church in particular? Well, in the past, <clears throat> the church has had a board of directors or a corporate board, essentially, and they've hired outside pastors, and sometimes that's gone well, and sometimes that's gone not so well. And some of you who have been around here for a while can remember the that we've had some tyrannical attempts from previous pastors. And as we can see from the scripture, and as is my point for today, the scriptural model is very different from that. And if we're going to be a church, we have to follow scripture. If a church doesn't follow the word of God, it can't be the church of God. So with that, <clears throat> with that said, I'd like to ask the following men to step forward. Jim, Larry, Dad. Charlie would be here, but I'd like you guys to come down to the front if you don't mind. <clears throat> Charlie was going to be here too, but because of the weather, he was a little bit delayed. Yep. He's making his way. <laughs> so I'm going to get there. <laughs> the elder elders. <laughs> the elder of the elders. <laughs> uh. You, you, you three, you all heard the, the weight of responsibility that the word places yes. on the elders of the church. And by taking this responsibility, you devote yourselves to God's word and to this congregation, whether there's three people here or 3,000. Now, as, as you and as we do that, I'm going to challenge us together. Just as the scripture says, the elders were appointed with, with prayer and fasting. My challenge is for us this week to devote ourselves to prayer and fasting. Pray that God will lead us as elders and lead this church. Amen. Pray that he would give us godly men and women who are willing and equipped to serve as deacons, talented and willing to use their skills in whatever way furthers God's mission for this church. That. And I would encourage you to choose some form of fasting that you think is appropriate for this week 
and choose to give it up as a symbol of devotion to the Lord for this week as a, a symbol of your dedication to the Lord and how we would like him to answer that prayer. And by praying and fasting this way, we continue the tradition of elders, pastors, overseers before us for 2,000 years. Men who knew they were about to be thrown into lion's dens. Men who knew they were about to be burned at the stake. It's a heavy title and responsibility that you take upon yourselves. So, <clears throat> as the church as a whole uh, gathered together a few weeks back and laid hands uh, on me, I'm now going to ask all of you to come forward and we're going to lay hands on these men and pray for them in the name of the Lord. <clears throat>